Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming to our monthly program hosted by the Rhinebeck Historical Society. Um, driving from Rhinebeck South towards Statsburg on Route 9, there are a couple of distinctive land features that can be viewed from the road. First are the wide, flat features of Grasmere, south of the cemetery. Further south, the road dips a bit and it passes by the fields of the Southlands Foundation on the right, and to the east is a steep cliff where the old time community of Hillside, also known as Wurdenburg Hills, was located and where a group of Palatine settled early on. A number of years ago, when I started taking riding lessons at Southlands, I learned more about the land that was once part of the Dow's Olin Estates. Part of the land was pretty flat, but on the west and south, the streams and creeks cut into the soil, creating on their way to the Hudson steep banks. The flat land contained a lot of mud that the horses loved to roll in and had to be brushed off. And scattered around were large round stones, cobbles that must have rolled into place by some powerful force. <coughs> My curiosity about the forces that shaped the land led me to reading the book the Hudson Valley and the Ice Age, a geological history and tour written by Robert and Joanna Titus. Dr. Titus is a paleontologist who teaches at the geology department at Hartwick College, uh, formerly known as the Hartwick Seminary for local historians. Uh, Joanna Titus is a molecular biologist who teaches in the Allied Health and Biological Science Department at SUNY Duchess. Between the two of them, they have written several books about the geology of the Catskills and articles for the Catskill Life magazine, the Register Star newspaper chain, and the Woodstock Times, and have given many presentations on the glaciers. And after the presentations, if you're interested, they do have copies of two of their books available for you to take a look at and take home if you like. So, um, after completing the book, I found enough information for me to begin deciphering the history of the land, not only around Southlands, but all along the Hudson River. I'm sure you will find their presentation informative and revealing about the early history of Rhinebeck. Please welcome Robert and Joanna. We first, of course, like to thank Rhinebeck Historical Society for inviting us. And yes, for those of you who don't know us, we are both working science professors, and we also write quite a lot. Um, we write weekly columns for the Columbia Green Media Group. That's a group of seven newspapers. There is the newest one coming down here, and it's called the River Chronicle. So you may have seen copies of that. Our columns will be in that. And we write monthly articles for the Woodstock Times and also quarterly articles for Catskill Life magazine. <coughs> Excuse me. We also occasionally write a book. And yes, our latest one is Hudson Valley. Whoops. Hudson Valley in the Ice Age. Our goal in all our publications and talks is to couple our science with the culture of the Hudson Valley and its surroundings. Um, the art, the history, the literature, architecture, and industry. And gather it all and hopefully explain it for all of the general reading public. So our book came about from our many journeys up and down the Hudson Valley. We probably, just like you, tour museums, attend concerts, events just like this at many of the venues and historic places. We've explored the riverbanks, hiked on many of the trails in those parks, and hope to do that for at least a few more years to come. So our own education about the Hudson Valley and its treasures continues in earnest. Our journeys along the Hudson Valley are ongoing, but regardless of where we go in the valley, we keep and we kept seeing the same thing. Everywhere we go, we become surrounded 
by the story of the Ice Age. We realize that from the time soon after Henry Hudson arrived in this valley, people were discovering the rich history that the Ice Age had left behind. Although few, especially back then, if any, understood just how that history came about. From the discovery in 1705 of the first prehistoric remains ever recovered in North America, a mastodon <coughs> tooth in Columbia County, and the elders of the day, the wise men, decided that this was a tooth from a biblical giant. And they also really, truly believed that those giants were still roaming the Hudson Valley. It turned out it took an African slave to recognize that that was a tooth that looked very similar to an elephant's. And finally, someone had a basis on which to judge that tooth. But, um, so this was the first prehistoric remains ever recovered in North America. <coughs> and to the portrayal of this valley's scenic beauty by the painters of the Hudson River School, Thomas Cole, Frederick Church, Sanford Gifford, Jasper Cropsey, it's one of our favorite places to go, um, Thomas Benjamin Pope, and that's the Hudson Highlands, that's down south a little bit, and William Bartlett, just to name a few of the painters of the Hudson River School. What they didn't know was that they were painting a landscape, beautiful landscape, but a landscape that had been defined, had been shaped by the Ice Age. They introduced this valley and its Ice Age history <coughs> to the world. Perhaps you've been to that location. It's the Catskill Mountain House Ledge, uh, site of the Catskill Mountain House Hotel. <coughs> it's one of the most historic locations in all of the Catskills. And uh, if you go there again, I want you to go there armed with knowledge. I want you to stand on the edge of the ledge and look into the valley. I want you to see a glacier coming down the valley from the north and swelling up within the valley and rising closer and closer to you until it actually swells over the lip of that ledge and moves into the Catskills and beyond. What an image to contemplate. What an image to come up with in your mind's eye. And what knowledge to know. Uh, the purpose of our books is to transport our readers into the past. It's a sort of thing that you could say, and you're sort of making a semi-joke, but I'm really quite serious uh, about it when I say that. We want you to go to various locations in the Hudson Valley, and we want you to see those landscapes as they were, uh, as the glaciers approached and as the glaciers overran those locations, and then even especially when the glaciers melted away uh, from those uh, vicinities. Most people really don't appreciate how big this event was. Uh, this was a big glacier. We call it an ice sheet. It's a better phrase than glacier. <coughs> the only thing comparable to it today is the ice sheet that covers Antarctica. And our continent had the equivalent was the equivalent of Antarctica, oh, 20,000 years ago in nice round numbers, including right here, all of New York State. The glacier reached down to what we call Long Island today, and even created uh, Long Island. The strategy, again, of our book is to put pictures in it uh, of locations where it's easy for you to go and visit, and to show you the Ice Age features so that you can read the landscape and see and perceive and uh, comprehend what the glaciers did there. There, Johanna and I, years ago, hiked up uh, in the Gunks uh, on uh, the Blue Trail at Lake Minnewaska, and it was early in the morning, the sun was just rising, and the light was reflecting off of the rocks. They were shiny. 
and uh, they were shiny and polished even, and the surface was scratched, we call it striated. It looked as if something had processed that ledge, had worked on that ledge, and something hadn't. We knew it right away. We were following in, if you can call it, the footsteps of a glacier. We were hiking up the Blue Trail, following in the path that the glaciers had preceded us uh, thousands and thousands of years ago. And the sunlight was just right for us to perceive that. There's no reason most people should notice this sort of thing. Uh, only those who've learned that glaciers can polish bedrock and scratch bedrock are likely to notice when those features are right there in front of you. But it transports you, again, in your mind's eye to the distant Ice Age past. You can see this all over the place. These features are very common. Here's Central Park in New York City. And the rock there was polished by an ice which passed going away from us here. Not only polished the rock, not only striated the rock, but grooved the surface of that bedrock. And there it is, right in the heart of New York City. Stand in the park, look up into the sky, and see two or 3,000 feet of ice <laughs> rising above you and then blink again and look and see that it's Central Park. What an experience that sort of thing is. And what a wonderful thing it is to be able to recognize that sort of thing and to appreciate what you're recognizing. Here's one of those wonderful things you see on the surface of a rock. We spend a lot of time, Johanna and I, looking at the rocks, looking down <laughs> everywhere we go. And sometimes we see features which is so easy to miss but once you know what to look for, it's hard to miss. They're called chattered marks, uh, or crescentic marks. They mark the passage of not a, not a glacier so much as a boulder being pushed by the ice. The boulder was pressed down by the weight of the ice, and then pushed from behind it, leaked forward, pressed down into the rock, it pushed from behind it, leaked forward. And each time it leaked forward, it left a nick, a deep nick in this case, into the bedrock. You can simulate this with your hand on, a, on the surface of a table, and you push them behind until your hand jumps forward. And that's what the ice did, the glacier did so long ago in this location. Here's a close-up. This is from North Lake uh, Park. And this is back at Minnewaska. Gertrude's Nose. Perhaps you've been to Gertrude's Nose. It's a beautiful location. People hike up there and they go there for the scenery, for the scenic beauty of it. Johanna and I love the scenic beauty. We're normal people most of the time. But we see again into the past. And we see a glacier moving from our right across that surface, polishing the rock and striating the rock. And then as it continued off to the right, in this picture, yanking great masses of bedrock out of the earth and dragging them off, leaving a magnificent cliff behind. Once the glacier melted, there was a magnificent cliff left behind. Johanna and I go to a place like this, and we see the direct evidence of the glacier passing by, and then a little bit more indirect evidence of a glacier yanking rock out of the rock and creating a scenic landscape that's given a name, Gertrude's Nose. Again, if you happen to go there in the future, you'll be carrying with you knowledge, which will give you an appreciation for the landscape. Even boulders. We can't walk by a boulder anywhere in the Hudson Valley without appreciating, my goodness, where did that boulder come from? It just didn't fall out of the sky, did it? It was pushed there by a glacier. Only glaciers can move boulders around of this sort. And when the ice melted, the boulder was left behind. We call it a glacial erratic. I want you, from now on, for the rest of time, the rest of your life, to never walk by a boulder anywhere around here without realizing that it's almost certain that a glacier carried the boulder to where it is today, and when it melted, it left it behind. What a thing to know. It used to just be a big rock. <laughs> now it's an Ice Age feature. And now you're a little bit smarter than you were. <laughs> well, how far did the ice get? I've already given that away. The glacier, the ice sheet, advanced to what we call Long Island, pushing and shoving sediment in front of it to create Long Island. At its absolute maximum advance, it left a ridge of sediment that we call a terminal moraine. 
And if you know what to look for, and you will in a minute, you can recognize a moraine. It's a heap of earth. It's sand and silt and clay and gravel and cobbles and boulders and dead elephants and things that were left there by the advance of the ice. The glacier melted back and then re-advanced. And the northernmost coast of Long Island is a recessional moraine. Two steps forward, one back, two steps forward, one back, and then it was one step forward, two steps back. Throughout the rest of the Ice Age. This is what a glacier does. It leaves a heap of earth where it had been when it reached its absolute peak advance as far to the south as it was going to go. That represented a moment in time when the climate was as cold as it was ever going to get. And it warmed up. The glacier retreated, and in this case is still retreating, leaving sheets of sand, pools of water, streams, swamps, <coughs> leaving a glaciated <coughs> landscape behind. And that glaciated landscape is still there. The ice is gone, but the landscape is there for people like Johanna and I who can recognize it, and soon I hope you. And look what we get. We've done this. We got in the car and drove all over Columbia County looking for recessional moraines. And every time we found one, we'd put a little X on the map. Geologists had been doing this for decades, generations even. And they got there first, and they created these maps of the retreat of the ice. Two steps backwards, one step forward, two steps backwards, one step forward. It got warm for a while, cooled down a little bit. Got warm for a while, cooled down a little bit. And the glacier advanced and retreated. And every time it advanced, it left a recessional moraine, which means all you have to do is know what to look for. Here it is. We were driving east from Red Hook one day, and Johanna said, stop here. And, I said, and she said, look, there it is. And north of the highway uh, was, you see how they, oops, drawn this as little heaps of earth. Well, they got it right. Look at that. Just like on the map, heaps of earth. The house is perched on a heap of earth. This is a recessional moraine. And this is a sheet of sand that washed out of that moraine. It extends across the highway. It's a swamp today. It's a little bit of a stream going through it. We always have a shovel in the back of our car. I'll show it to you if you don't think so. It's there. And, and a day like this, I jump out and I stick the shovel into the ground. Of course, if it's all sand, the shovel will go right into the ground. If it's usual earth around here, you know, two rocks for every dirt, it won't. It won't. Well, here, it smoothly went into the ground. It was the, what we call an outwash plain, <coughs> sand that washed out from the moraine. And in the distance, the moraine itself. And then in our mind's eye, we saw rising three or four or five hundred feet above that horizon, the blue-gray uh, image of the glacier that had once been there. In our mind's eye, we could stand and we could see the glacier, we could see it melting, we could watch as flows of water washed out across this surface, carrying sand with them to deposit the landscape feature that's there today. What a wonderful experience. You should be very envious of us by now, and for, good, for very good reason. Uh, our journeys through the Hudson Valley are different from most of your journeys. We just always see Ice Age features everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Well, once in a while you get to see into a moraine where the nice folks at the highway department have bulldozing. I can't get right through it. And what you see is typical big, broken, shattered rocks are typical of a moraine. They were broken by the advance of the ice, pushing big boulders and turning them into little boulders, and then left behind when the ice began melting and retreated from its then location. We're always very aware uh, to notice this sort of thing, and the highway department has been very kind to us in a number of locations, cutting through moraines and letting us see what we expected to see. Now, a pond, uh, a pool, it's not much more than a pool. Uh, it's, not, it's a ho-hum thing, isn't that nice? Look, let's go fishing, maybe. But this is a funny one. There's no creek leading into it, no creek leading out of it. Hall. 
I hadn't noticed that before. Oh, well, it's different. Ponds are supposed to have creeks flowing into them and out of them. This is different. It's called a kettle. A kettle pond. Well, this is science. This is, you're, you're smiling. You're enjoying this far too much. Way too much. I want you to remember back in high school when you took science. You weren't smiling then, were you? Oh, yeah. yeah. oh no. Yeah. This is, this is a, called a kettle pond. There used to be a block of ice there. When the glacier was melting away, a remnant, an iceberg, a land-based iceberg, was left behind. It was mostly buried in the sediments that the glacier had brought. And it might have taken centuries to melt. These are big blocks of ice. It takes that long. And when it finally melted, a pool of water was left behind. There was no need to bring a, pond, a creek into it. There was no need to drain a creek out of it. It's called a kettle pond. It's just a different kind of pond. And I want you to remember that for the rest of your lives. You see a pond? I went, Darn it, it's time to notice these things. And when you're with the Cub Scouts, Say, look, there's no creek flowing into it, no creek flowing out of it. I want you to imagine a block of ice rising out of the ground and the Cub Scouts will go, <gasps> they will think you're so smart. They will think you're so smart. They will, they will. How far did the glacier go and what happened when it started melting away? The moraine, the terminal moraine, passes right through Flushing, where the 64 World's Fair was, into New Jersey. It cut across the Watchung Mountains. And when the ice drained away, the moraine became an earthen dam, and it created great lakes, Lake Flushing, Lake Passaic, Lake Hudson. Most of the New York City metropolitan area was a big lake, it was a Lake Erie sort of a situation. When we visit these areas, we, in our mind's eye, we see a great lake, and we see the Empire State Building rising out of the waters. We can't help it, we just have to see that sort of thing. Uh, and for real, we see the Statue of Liberty you know, they're rising out of a lake. And the reason we see that is the lake occupies the space that today is Manhattan. And that those buildings would have risen out of the water had the they and the lake been there at the same time. They can share space, they just can't share the time. Lakes are important to us as we continue to the north we find out there is a very big one. It's called Glacial Lake Albany. The reason it's called Glacial Lake Albany is that the city of Albany is right in the middle of the lake bottom. You probably never paid much attention, but Albany is not San Francisco. You don't drive up and down and up and down. The trolleys don't go up slopes. Albany's flat, pool table flat. I want you to notice that the next time you're in Albany. It's the bottom of a lake. If you, could, if you bring a shovel along, you can jump out, stick it into the ground. It'll slide smoothly into silts and clays. It'll slide smoothly into lake deposits. What had been mud at the bottom of a lake? Probably 60 feet deep and about 10 miles across. This was a big lake. It was the equivalent of Lake Champlain. Glacial Lake Albany is gone. Lake Champlain is still there. Lake Champlain just happens to be a, an Ice Age lake that didn't drain uh, the way our lake did. It would be a very different Hudson Valley had this lake not drained away. There would be an enormous lake in the bottom of it. Well, we see this everywhere. We're driving down the thruway and Johanna said, stop. <laughs> there it is. She's in charge of saying stop. <laughs> He's good at it. <laughs> and uh, I jumped out and with a shovel, stuck it into the ground turned over a shovel full of silt and clay, mud, with lake deposits. And we stood, and all of a sudden flat became interesting. Right, this is not great scenery, is it? It's flat. This is not the Grand Canyon. <coughs> this is just flat. But when you stand on it, and you look up 60 feet, you see water above you, and you realize you're standing, on, literally standing on the bottom of a lake. Flat becomes a lot more interesting than it used to be. A lot more interesting. And yet, to everybody else, or most everybody else, it's just a flat landscape. Ho hum, who cares? You know? <laughs> Nothing ever happens around here. <laughs> well, when you go to Montgomery Place, I'd like you to remember this. The beautiful front yard of Montgomery Place, the beautiful circular driveway, the carriages that brought muckamucks to the front door of the great mansion on the Hudson. 
The mansion is built on the bottom of a lake. Take something out of it. It doesn't seem right that Montgomery Place should be at the bottom of a lake. There it is. It's a beautiful mansion. It's a beautiful property. It's so nice that it's open to the public. We see things there that nobody else or most other people don't see, except for you when you take the Girl Scouts. <laughs> Wave your arm. The Girl Scouts will be astonished. We get to see the sediments once in a while. It's not just a matter of sticking a shovel into the ground. But sometimes uh, nature has obligingly exposed the stratified layers of what you would call mud. We're looking at the deposits of Glacier Lake, Albany, in the town of Saugerties, uh on the Esopus Preserve. If you know exactly where to go, it took us a little hunting, you too can see these deposits. Well, when you have a big lake, you're going to have rivers flowing into the big lake, carrying sediment and depositing a delta. And the best big river that flowed into Lake Albany was the Mohawk. And during the time that Lake Albany existed, the Mohawk River deposited a delta, a big delta. Uh, when you think delta, you think the Nile Delta, the Mississippi River Delta. Uh, but this is a pretty decent one. And uh, the delta was left behind when the lake trained. It was an elevated platform composed of easy, well-drained sands. And centuries ago, people came along and said, this is going to be a great place to build my house. The ground is porous, it's well-drained. If I want a basement, it'll be easy to dig into. They didn't know that it was an Ice Age deposit, an Ice Age delta. They just thought it was a nice place to build a house. And a second family, and a third family, and a fourth family. And pretty soon there was a city, two of them. Schenectady and Rotterdam are built upon this Ice Age feature, the Mohawk River Delta, which rises well above the floor of what's the rest of the lake. Now, in Elisaville, it's not far from here, uh, if you know where to look, uh, Elisaville, if you know the town at all, it's built on another delta, the Elisaville Delta. And when you go to Elisaville, you'll, if you know how to drive the right way, you'll have to go up the front of the delta onto the flat top where the village is itself, and you realize you're <coughs> on a delta. Well, if they built a quarry, they cut a sand pit into it. If you remember your high school uh, science class, which I hope you do, you might have learned about deltas. And you would have learned that the front of a delta is steeply inclined sediment. It's called the foreset. The top of the delta is horizontal beds of strata. It's called the top set. And the rest of the delta is called the bottom set. This thing is right out of a textbook. Absolutely right out of a textbook. It is a beautiful delta deposit. Where a sand pit is simply cut into the village of Elisaville. And Johanna spotted this one. She said, stop! <laughs> Jump out and shoot a picture. She's got, I'm driving, I'm paying attention to the road. She's spotting things. It was a beautiful thing to see and a wonderful thing to see, the cross-section of a delta. Now, once you know what to look for, it becomes obvious. Here's the top set of the delta. The four set of the delta is a steep slope. The bottom of the, le of the lake, Glacial Lake Albany, is the bottom set. Who recognizes the house? Yeah, yeah, it's Springwood. It's Franklin Roosevelt's home uh, in Hyde Park. It says Springwood. That's Springwood, yeah, yeah. And when you learn more about it, you find that the whole village of Hyde Park is built upon a pretty big delta, the Hyde Park Delta. When you're going through Hyde Park the next time, I want you to notice that the town is flat. The top of the delta is always very flat. And when you drive to places like this, you can see the front of the delta, the Vanderbilt Mansion, uh, shows just exactly this sort of thing. And again, you see the landscape as you never saw it before. When you stand right here, you're up to your knees in water, because the tops of deltas are just barely underwater. And if you look west, you're gazing out across a lake that stretches to the other side of the Hudson Valley. What an experience. What a thing to see, what a thing to appreciate. What a transformation of the landscape into its historic heritage. Now, 
we always try to have a local twist when we come to some town and give a talk. And so when we knew we were coming to Rhinebeck, we got the maps out and we poured over the maps and we said, aha, aha, look at that, yes, yes, they're going to love it. They're going to love it. I want you to see Lansman Creek, which you've never paid attention to before. It's no big river. Here's the village of Rhinebeck, as it was about uh, almost 100 years ago when this map was built. And Lansman Creek comes out from the east, flows across a flat surface at the top of town, goes down a slope, and then makes its way, cutting through a canyon, to get to the Hudson River. There is a flat landscape that Rhinebeck is built upon, 60 feet lower, is another flat landscape. Your town is built on the top set of the Landsman Delta. And the edge of town, the western edge of town, the houses disappear, is the four set, and out here is the bottom of Glacial Lake Albany. Your town is here because of the Ice Age. Your town is built upon a Ice Age Delta, just the way Schenectady is, just the way uh, uh, many villages are, Elisaville is another one. Your village is here, and the library is here because of the Ice Age. People came along and they said, oh, a good place to put my house. It's easy to dig in the soil, it's well drained, the basement won't be flooding all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a good place to build a house. They had no idea about the Ice Age. They well, that's your local twist. Now, when you drive west on your way to Wilderstein, you'll be going across a flat surface until you go down a slope. It's not a very steep slope, it's a subtle slope, but it's the front of the delta. At the bottom of that slope, it flattens out once again until you get to Wilderstein, like Montgomery Place. Wilderstein is built on the floor of Glacial Lake Albany. You know, all the stuff to know about Daisy Suckley and Franklin Roosevelt. You saw the movie, didn't you? And what you didn't know, what they didn't go into enough in the movie, was the fact that this house is at the bottom of a lake. <laughs> they needed better technical advising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Franklin drives Daisy out into the country and says, there used to be a lake here. <laughs> I'm sure that's what he said. I'm sure of it. So are you. But isn't it a wonderful thing? Uh, 60 feet would take you to the top of the gable there, and that's where the lake waters went. <coughs> that was where the lake level was. What a thing to think. What a thing to know. Hmm. What a thing. What a strange thing. It's a heritage. Well, at the end of the Ice Age, the glaciers were melting. You had 3,000 or 4,000 feet of ice rising above you right here. When you go outside uh, a little bit later, still just light enough, I want you to look up into the sky and see 4,000 feet and put ice between you and there. Yeah, ice, really, glacier. Uh, what happens when all of that melts? Well, we go to a place called Catterskill Clove, we get a pretty good idea of what happens when a place like that melts. There is the Clove. It's a V-shaped valley, majestic, beautiful scenery, uh, just as nice as you can get east of the Rocky Mountains. It used to be rock. Uh, it's bedrock. That's bedrock. It must have been bedrock here. It was eroded away. Bedrock was converted into canyon, a mile deep, or a thousand feet deep. That's a very impressive canyon where bedrock was converted into sediment and carried off by the flow of water. Where did all that sediment go? Well, look. There it is. Palinville is built on a great fan of sediment. The roads, the streams, the side streets all radiate out from the mouth of Catterskill for a clove. There's a great heap of sediment, shaped like a lady's fan, from late 19th century, a fan of sediment. It used to be the stuff that filled that canyon. I want you to now look at this picture and fill the bottom of that canyon up with rage, foam, pounding, thundering, torrents of white water cascading down the slopes sound so great it would hurt your ears. What an image. And that's what you learn when you get into the canyon. 
This is called the Red Chasm, very favorite place to go in August when the water is warmed up. You can go swimming there. Maybe some of you have been. And look at that towering cliff that rises above you. It was once filled with meltwater. Thousands of feet of ice are melting, raging, foaming, pounding, thundering, torrents of white water cascading down the canyon, slicing through the bedrock as if it was warm butter. And really, that's what happened. We go down there and we stand and we look upstream and we realize well, fully what we're looking at. A ho! <laughs> ho! What an experience it is to see these things and understand them. They're pretty, but they say so much more. Well, our journey through North Lake is interrupted one day uh, when we took a good look at the map and we saw a canyon here and a canyon there and we said, huh, if you have a canyon you're supposed to have a stream at the bottom of it, right? The Colorado River is at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. There's no water in these canyons. What on earth is going on here? When nature presents you with something like this and you're a geologist, You've got to go out and find the answer to the problem. You know you're on to something. And there it is. This is the first of those two canyons. Sure enough, there's no water in that. In fact, trees are growing. It's so dry. But there must have been water there once. At the end of the Ice Age, when the Hudson Valley Glacier was melting, raging, foaming, pounding, thundering, torrents of white water were cascading away from us, down that So Who sold you that ticket? <laughs> Couldn't you have gotten a better ticket? You're running the show. Oh, you're going to watch this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Look, here's another one. This is a wonderful moment. We were climbing one of these canyons. I was out in front of Johanna. Here she is coming up behind, our son, ahead of her. And it's the moment of discovery. I rather thought like, we would see something like this. It was better than we th I thought it would be. And we saw one of these dry canyons. Behind me, when I took this picture, it had been a glacier melting. <laughs> Sound so loud it would hurt your ears. <laughs> and we had discovered yet another of these features. To the best of my knowledge, I think these are real discoveries. I'm not sure anybody had ever noticed these things uh, before we came along. I swelled with a little pride. <laughs> but again, what a thing to travel these Catskill landscapes and to see the geological heritage that's right in front of you. <clears throat> well, over at Olana, uh, we're very fond of the Hudson Valley School of Art. Uh, we've been very active. Uh, you might, and uh, well, I'll be doing a, uh, a, a, a hike there in September, a uh, Hudson Valley ramble. And uh, I'll be circling the mansion, waving my arms at the uh, geology that's to be seen there. Uh, you might come along, you might think about coming along uh, for that. This is something that friends of Frederick Church discovered on his property. It's called a pothole. It's 300 feet above the Hudson River. And it's a mass, a whirling mass of water that drilled the hole into the bedrock. We see these today in powerful streams <clears throat> where a flow of water forms a circle and lit literally augers its way into the bedrock. Well, those are modern streams with modern flows of water, but this is 300 feet above the Hudson River, the level of the Hudson River. How could you have had a torrent, a torrent of water there, except if a glacier was melting and massive flows of water are pouring off the melting ice and drilling a hole into the bedrock. We've been searching and searching and searching for this. We rather think it's the hole was filled in. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have uh, a, accounts written by two geologists, and Frederick Church himself, who uh, was astonished to find that he was, quote, the proud owner of a hole in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't paint it. <laughs> well, we get to the end of the Ice Age. There must have been one last advance. A moment in time when the last glacier was coming down the Hudson Valley. And you can imagine this by looking at pictures such as these, and then walking out on the crossway across the Hudson, walkway across the Hudson, 
and uh, looking north. At the middle of the walkway, look north and put that picture into your mind's eye. There must have been a moment in time when a final glacier was coming down the Hudson, and you can see it on the walkway. That last advance of the ice was different from all the others because the landscape features that it created are still there. If you're a stamp collector, you'd call them in mint condition. Uh, they have been very little altered since the moment when the glacier has melted away. The prominent feature are these hills, which are narrow, uh, steep walk left and right, teardrop shape, you might say. And when you find one like potato chips, you can't just don't get one. One, <laughs> two, three, four, five, six, I think seven. They're called drumlins. And when that last glacier melted away, they emerged beneath it. And they had been sculpted. There's no doubt about it. They had been sculpted uh, by the advance of the ice during that last advance of the ice. Late at night in geology bars, <laughs> Geologists debate exactly how the sculpting effect occurred, but there is no question about it. There's so many of them. This is what a drumlin looks like from the ground. And there's no reason why it should call attention to itself. There's no reason you've passed hundreds of them in your lifetime. There's no reason why you should have ever noticed any of them. But they are important. Look at how many there are. And they speak to us of the movement of the ice. This is where we live. We live right about there, in Freehold, in Greenville. And the Drumlins moved down Basic Creek and moved down Eight Mile Creek. They were confined to these shallow valleys. The flow of ice was confined to these shallow valleys. And as it advanced, it sculpted the shapes of these hills that we call Drumlins. And we just don't know exactly how that happened, and we do debate that uh, late at night. <laughs> there are important landscape features in the Hudson Valley. There are quite literally hundreds of them. And once you get an eye, you develop an eye for noticing them, you will see them all over the place. We have spent many a happy afternoon with a map in one hand and a steering wheel in the other uh, going around and visiting. Uh, the drumlins that are so frequently seen, especially just a little bit north of here. Well, I get one final thing here, the big one. There was a moment in time when the glacier had retreated right here to the northwestern corner of the Adirondack Mountains. It had created Lake Champlain, which blended into Glacial Lake Albany, and there was one massive lake and filled these valley systems, and a bigger one to the west, Glacial Lake Iroquois. You can see the problem. When the ice melts back just a little bit more, a little trickle of water will pass between the Adirondacks and the retreating ice, and it will quickly become an enormous torrent <coughs> of white water cascading down. The Champlain Lowlands, through the Hudson Valley, on eventually into the Atlantic Ocean. There was a flood involving as much water as would be in all of the Great Lakes today five times over. I think, Johanna, you ran a number and thought it would be about 80 days. Uh, you could stand at the mountain house ledge and look down into the bottom of the valley and probably hear it from up there and see this enormous flood of water rushing by. What a sight that must have been. Oh, I wish we had a video of that. <laughs> uh, what a thing to imagine, though. And it must have happened. They find out on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean out here, boulders the size of small cars, which match the Adirondacks, and apparently tumbled all the way down the valley and were carried out into the ocean by this horrible, horrible event. You think the Texas floods were bad, do you? <laughs> this is so much worse. Well, it even helped to create what we call the Hudson Canyon, which cuts across uh, the uh, floor of the shallow floor of the Atlantic Ocean in that vicinity. 
Oh, we're running out of time. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> You're enjoying yourself, aren't you? Yeah. You know, if you have to leave, though, please don't be shy. Um, soon after people settled around here, they realized that the banks of the Hudson River were lined with all those sediments we've been telling you about, uh, clays mostly, and they made the perfect bricks. So from Staten Island all the way up to Hudson and New Baltimore in the north, the river was lined on both sides with brickworks. A great industry, begun really in the earliest days of European settlement, but really bolstered by the need for New York City to have material that was fire resistant for their buildings, especially after a great fire wrecked most of the city in 1835. So this became an industry that supplied a billion bricks a year just to New York City. Very, very, very big industry. And that's Hutton and Kingston, Ferrier and Golden in Catskill. And each of these bricks, if you like to collect bricks, if you walk along the Hudson and find a brick here or there, you can tell which brickyard it came from, from the initials that are on the brick. And there are a lot of people that go up and down the river looking for that last brick that they haven't found yet. You can also see, if you look hard on all of these pictures, that there are places where all of the sediment has been removed and they're now using it for a different area, for a storage area or a drying barn or something of that nature. So they did this year after year until oh, about the end of the First World War. There were lighter, better building materials being engineered. And very slowly, the brick industry went down. But there are a lot of ruins up and down the Hudson Valley that you can go and see. This is the Empire in Stockport. It's by Hudson. And this is, I just wanted to show you a couple of my favorite buildings in New York City that Hudson Valley Bricks built. And this is the Park Avenue Armory. Isn't that pretty? Very lovely building. And my favorite subway station that's down on Wall Street is called Bowling Green. Yeah, and it's very quaint, very old fashioned, but still quite remarkable building. But there's a good side to this. A lot of bricks, a lot of buildings, a lot of places that didn't burn because we were able to make bricks to supply them. But those same clays wonderful for brick making, can cause problems given the right circumstances. I don't know why I'm letting you do this part. I usually do this part. I <laughs> uh, one very, we publish 75 columns per year and so we address the general reading public at least once a week, uh, often more than once a week. And we have to take ourselves pretty seriously sometimes. Mm -hmm. Recently, there was a landslide on the Norman scale just a month ago or so. It was a landslide on the Norman scale, and we were uh, immediately <coughs> covering that story <coughs> as journalists, as honest to goodness, no kidding around journalists. It's important <coughs> because landslides can hurt people. Landslides can destroy homes. Landslides can do damage. This is one of the most infamous moments of a landslide event in the Hudson Valley. It's in Troy, 1859, March, and what would have been St. Peter's College, uh, which would have been a big building, it hadn't even been finished, was wiped out, destroyed by a landslide uh, in just minutes. And this portrayal uh, from uh, one of the big news magazines of the day is a little bit overblown, but it's relatively accurate. This what would have been St. Peter's College, which would have been an important college, I'll bet, by now. Big basketball team, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> and that was wiped off. It never occurred. It never happened. It never opened up because of a landslide. Well, that's bad. Uh, 
this is another one, the Havistraw Brickyard landscape in 1906, and 19 people uh, killed by that event. I think about a half dozen were never even found. Uh, they were buried in the landslide sediments, and it would have been a very awful death uh, for all of them, a terrible, terrible thing. Very serious business. And uh, the whole Hudson Valley, north to south, is prone for landslides, and people had rather know that, and people need to understand that. When we read the news coverage of the recent landslide, it was clear that the journals didn't know a thing. Uh, they hadn't taken much in the way of geology, and they didn't understand what had happened, and they were sort of aghast by it and unable to explain it. We could. Uh, we understand what kind, what makes these events. This is the Knickerbocker Portland Cement Company slide, 1915. Uh, five workers killed in minutes. Uh, a terrible, terrible thing. This is the Delmar slump. This is the first one that we covered ourselves back in the year 2000. And this is what happens. Uh, the wall in the back is steep and a great mass of earth slides downhill uh, away, in this case, fortunately, from the parking lot. Nobody was hurt uh, in this event. It was very damaging to the parking lot, uh, but it could have been a lot worse uh, than that. Uh, this is the Norman scale. Uh, slide from April, just this last April, and uh, it didn't hurt anybody either. It did damage the golf course that was located there. The red is the landslide hazard, and you'll recognize that as being essentially glacial Lake Albany. Those sediments of Lake Albany are prone to landsliding. The river is cut into them. It's created steep slopes, cutting through soft, often wet sediments, and setting up high landslide uh, uh, incidences. Well, it's been our job and uh, to write about this in our newspaper columns <coughs> and to explain how these landslides occur and where they are likely to continue occurring. And we, in the course of the next month, will be doing between four and six columns about the landslide threat in the Hudson Valley. It's a very serious uh, business. I don't think you have to worry about it here in Rhinebeck, uh, except uh, right at Wilderstein. There's a steep slope there. Yeah, you heard it first. <laughs> I don't think it will reach the mansion, but it would be perfectly plausible that the slope there could go at any time. And the Roosevelt Mansion and Vanderbilt. Yeah. <laughs> We, we sometimes have um, a not so great job of telling people. We also have been very active since uh, Irene and Lee and Sandy um, trying to explain to people who are flooded that unless they do something fundamental like move, <laughs> that they will be flooded again and trying to explain it to them scientifically why that's so. And we're going to do that again tomorrow night. <laughs> Wish us luck. Okay. Something um, a little lighter? Lighter. 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 Okay. How about elephants? How about elephants? <laughs> no talk about the Ice Age, especially around here, would be complete without mentioning what's truly become the symbol of the Ice Age in New York, and that's the Mastodon. Most people, when you say glacier, get a picture in their minds of this beautiful, glistening, pristine ice cube. Glaciers are not ice cubes. Glaciers are dirty, filthy conglomerates of ice and mud and boulders and ground up forests that destroy everything in front of them as they advance. If they can't contain that thing within them, they push it in front of them. So you can see down at the bottom, and this thing is about half a mile high, by the way. So you can see at the bottom these gigantic boulders, and they're just being pushed along in front of that glacier. These things destroy mountains and forests as they advance. Okay. So this 
is an image, and that river is about the size of the Hudson. And all that ruined valley is the devastation left behind from that wall of ice. No forests, few rolling hills, but mostly just the bare floor of an empty valley. And then that enormous, almost unimaginable wall of ice starts to melt. In our case, it would melt all the way back to Labrador. That's a lot of water. Okay. I don't know, I can't even imagine that much water. But I can't emphasize enough how very, very wet it was for a very long time in this valley. Big glacial lakes, smaller ponds, wetlands, swamps, you name it. Okay. Too wet for a very long time for forests to return. Too wet for trees to grow. And some of these areas, if you ride down Route 9, down 9G, you can see them. They're still here. And they're still wet. And that's where they came from. <clears throat> and in those areas, filled with all that water, there were also great amounts of sediment. The sediment that had been incorporated in that glacier came out along with the water as it melted. So all those forests and mountains that got pulverized, literally, into particles so small that we refer to them sometimes as rock flour. And eventually sank to the bottom of these wet areas and made a perfect fertilizer. So in these areas where the forest couldn't grow back because it was too wet, there was an abundance of algae and pond weeds in these wet areas. Now, it soon became warm enough that the mastodons, who had retreated to the south, we sometimes tell a joke and say they retreated to Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> And they started coming back up north, and they literally did. You can find a lot of mastodon remains down in Florida. They're very common down there. Um, they got to the Hudson Valley, and here they are, and they're fur, okay, built for the cold. And I don't know if you know this or not, but elephants can't sweat. That's why you see the elephants in the tropics today with those big ears flopping back and forth. Okay? Their blood vessels run through those ears and they flop them back and forth to cool down the blood as it circulates. Well, these guys were built for cold, not for the tropics. And so they came up to the Hudson Valley and they stopped and they said, we're in paradise. They had cool water. They could walk in and just lie down and be nice and cool. And while they did that, they had all those pond weeds that they could munch on. What else did they want? Okay. <coughs> but remember those sediments? Well, in they went into the ponds and the glacial lakes and those wet areas, and there they stayed. That oozy, sticky, mucky sediment acted like quicksand, and they couldn't move. And that's exactly where we find them today, in a layer of sediment that we call marl, that's right under the topsoil. <coughs> and about a hundred mastodons, to date, have been found up and down the Hudson Valley. Most of them in an area, if you can see that concentration, right there in Orange County. 
That area is also referred to as the drowned lands or the black dirt region. Yeah. I'll show you. There you go. And that was a place called Glacial Lake Wallkill. And it was one of the shallower glacial lakes. But made wonderful fertilized dirt. People grow lots and lots of vegetables. If you ever get a chance to go there in the fall, go. They have the most wonderful vegetables, especially onions. Um, so this one became a sort of La Brea Tar Pits New York style. Okay. Instead of tar, it was the sediments in the clays. <coughs> By 1800, the New America had Mastodon fever. Farmers were coming up to Orange County and digging up the land and getting ready to plant some crops, and they were also draining it. It wasn't called the drowned lands for nothing. The towns in that area all end with the word island. And it was because as they drained the land piece by piece, they created little islands that they lived on. And they had to use rowboats to get from one place to the other. So now it's almost all drained, but you can still see, I don't know if you can see the one of the canals that runs right around there. <coughs> Series of canals. Keep it drained enough so that they can grow crops. But around 1800, with all this digging going on and all this drainage being dug, the farmers started finding mastodons. They would find a tusk here, a bone there. But something else was going on around that time. It was a time when famous naturalists, especially one named Leclerc, who was also called the Comte de Buffon, uh, were publishing books on natural history. And Leclerc, let's see if we've got it, there he is, had a little inset in one of his books on natural history about America. And it was called The Theory of American Degeneracy. Well, he claimed that because of the climate in North America, everything in North America, whether it was a deer, a rodent, a Native American, didn't matter. Everything was small and inferior to the equivalent in Europe. Can you tell he's French? <laughs> <laughs> he even, by the time he got his book around Europe, suggested that if males from Europe went to the New World, that they might consider not staying very long, because they too might shrink. <laughs> and we won't discuss here what parts of the anatomy he was speaking of. <laughs> So that's what was going on. And at the same time, who should be in Paris but Thomas Jefferson? He was there trying to make trade agreements. Now can you imagine this poor man standing in the middle of Paris trying to make a trade agreement with someone, and this guy's there saying, oh, you don't want to make trade, they don't grow anything big there, nothing worthwhile. Okay. So he got really, really upset, Thomas Jefferson did. And he got his friend, the governor of New Hampshire, to send him a moose carcass. <laughs> he wrote to him and he said, send me the biggest moose you can find. I don't care how you get it, just send it to me. Well, it took him three tries. Okay, they didn't have like ice packing materials or any FedEx, nothing. <clears throat> so a couple of them got a little too... Uh, odiferous and were thrown overboard by the captains, but third time's the charm, right? He got his moose carcass, got someone to stuff it and mount it, 
was so incensed that he plopped this thing right in the middle of the lobby of his hotel and said, this is a big thing. <laughs> well, like I said, you know the French. They made fun of him. <laughs> so he kind of went back to America hanging his head, you know. And when he got back to America, he arrived in Philadelphia. He was a member of the first scientific society in America, which was the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia. Still exists, still has new members. And he talked them into mounting the first scientific expedition in America. They hired Charles Wilson Peale, who was, yes, an artist, a painter, but he was also a naturalist, gave him $500, which was a lot of money back then, and said to him, go find us a mastodon. We need something really big and ferocious, an American monster that we can send to the French, and they're never going to call us little again. Okay. <coughs> so where did Charles Wilson Peale go? He went to Orange County. Where else would he go? And he engineered some stuff to do this exhumation, excavation, whichever you'd like to call it. Got some patents for these pulleys and things that you see there. So it did a lot of excellent work, scientific work. And in the meantime, he found enough mastodon remains to build two complete mastodons. So they brought them back to Philadelphia to the best anatomists in the country at the time who were at the University of Pennsylvania. And they said, okay, we got to make these things really look fierce. So they padded every joint that they could as they rebuilt these things. And they deliberately, they knew better, they deliberately mounted the tusks upside down. <laughs> so now not only is this thing inflated to almost two times its size, it also has become this fierce, carnivorous animal. <laughs> Our poor veggie elephant. Well, one of them stayed in Philadelphia. Uh, the exhibit opened on Christmas Day, 1801. The night before, all of the Philosophical Society had dinner underneath the Mastodon. <laughs> they thought it was a cool thing to do, I guess. All right. So this guy stayed in Philadelphia. Eventually he went to Peel's Museum in Baltimore, which burnt down and the Mastodon was lost in that fire. The other one toured Europe for several years and wound up in a museum and I'm not going to try and pronounce that, in Germany. He is still there today. Perfectly fine. They took all the padding out, and they turned his tusks the right way around. So he really looks like a nice, cute little mastodon. And that's where he stays. Um, around here, closer by, in the year 2000, this poor man in Hyde Park was trying to landscape his pond. And he found a bone. And he called Vassar and he said, I found this bone. Well, probably about 24 hours later, he had about 500 college kids <laughs> attack his property. And it was a joint venture between uh, Vassar and Cornell. And they dug up the whole thing. and. This is what it looks like when you dig up a mastodon from a pond. Yeah. Uh, there's the tusk. <coughs> so they dug them all up. They found most of the bones. Just a few of the smaller bones were missing. And put him together and brought him up to Ithaca. And he is now displayed at the... Whoops. At the... 
Museum of the Earth in Ithaca that's associated with Cordell, and he is known as the Hyde Park Mastodon. And I, I don't want to disappoint people who like to think that Indians chase mastodons all up and down the Hudson Valley, but uh, like I said, we found 100 mastodons. 99 of them were found in the muck. A couple of them found even standing up where they had drowned. Um, none of them had any connection that we could find with Native Americans. So they did it to themselves. Uh, you know, that's in the Hudson Valley. Could have been other places in North America where Native Americans were certainly interacting with them. But as far as we know, not around here. And we think it's a shame, by the way, that this guy was found in Hyde Park, and he's not here. Yeah. And we think that maybe somebody should find another one, and <laughs> keep it on this side of the Hudson River, and keep it on display. You know, I'm sure we could find a space for it. So whether you venture south to the Hudson Highlands, or north to one of our favorite places, Olana, the home of Frederick Church, the Hudson River School painter. And this is one of his planned views, by the way, from the south porch of his house. Creates such a beautiful vista. We hope that from this day on, you'll join us now in seeing the Hudson Valley the way that we do, as a gift of the Ice Age. Thanks for coming. Thank